And I chose power, my PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, it's as before. Okay. Sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. How do I do that? This is very strange. I, I, I never knew to this situation. I, I think um, if you can hit like alt tab or whatever to shift with what window you have in focus, you can focus on the presentation instead of on your PowerPoint. Sorry, I'm not understanding what you're. I think um, if you start presenting before you select to share your screen in Zoom, you can select the, the actual presentation as the thing to share instead uh, of your PowerPoint window. Okay. But I think it can be tricky because because when you hit present, it will be full screen. So you need to have, well, I always use like a, sh a keyboard shortcut to change which window I have selected on my computer, but maybe you can. I don't know how to do that, but let me see if this works. Um, no. I've never had this problem before. Yeah, it's very strange. Sorry, what's the problem? I joined late. Oh, so, so still so cannot the, uh, make it a full screen. Maybe I should change what my Monitor is on this place. Oh, you know what I have a look. See if this helps. Oh, it works. Great. All right, good. Uh, we can try and go to the next page, maybe. Yeah, yeah. All right, good. Okay, great. You've... Yeah, what? so. Hello. Uh, hi, Steve. Uh, uh, hi, Steve. Uh, are you ready to start? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, but maybe you can make it to full screen, okay? Then we can start. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so maybe let's start. There are, there are already many people today. Uh, so hello, everyone. So today it's our great honor to have Professor Stephen Kivinson as our speaker. Uh, this is also the last seminar of this uh, RTC Superconductor series this year. Uh, we will continue next semester. Uh, I believe I do not need to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Kivinson. Uh, many of you are familiar with him. He is a professor in Stanford and he is famous for many of his works on strongly correlated systems incorporated and uh, also in other systems. Uh, so today Steve will tell us about his recent thought about the RTC Superconductor. 
Uh, let's welcome Steve. Uh, Steve, please. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, so this has been quite an a interesting uh, series of talks. I, I have to confess that the 7.30 a.m. start time in California has kept me from actually attending any of them, but I've uh, listened to a number of them on uh, uh, in recordings uh, and, uh, and of course, read all the abstracts. And uh, as you can see there, the field is very vibrant and active. There's all sorts of uh, new discoveries and new perspectives being put forward. Uh, and that, that shows what an what a exciting field it is. Um, having worked in this field, however, for a third of a century, <laughs> um, I, uh, I was struck by the fact that uh, in many cases, people felt that a new discovery meant that we should totally reconfigure our understanding of what's going on in the coup rates. And uh, so uh, what I was triggered to do is to think about what things do I think we've really understood? What things do new discoveries uh, cause us not to discard, but to try to figure out how these are compatible with things that we already know. Uh, oh, now, okay. Um, uh, in other words, uh, what has been understood about the essential features of this problem uh, during this time and by so many people working hard on this problem? Um, now, of course, in order to answer that question, I really should define what understood means and what essential features are. Uh, I had long discussions with this, uh, about this with my very philosophically uh, inclined daughter and we uh, uh, published a paper that I uh, recommend to you addressing what one should be after. I mean, really I was thinking about what, what does it mean to have a theory of high temperature superconductivity, but we cast, recast this in a more uh, broad uh, uh, light. And so I'm not going to talk about philosophical aspects, but I, uh, I recommend this paper to you. I'm very proud of it. Um, so uh, in trying to uh, organize my thoughts on how to uh, uh, discuss this topic, I uh, remembered that a few years ago, Phil Anderson published a paper called Last Words on the Coup Rates. Um, Phil spent, I guess, almost the last half of his scientific life working on this project. And uh, uh, like, like all theorists of my generation, uh, I have complicated uh, reactions to things that Phil Anderson says, but certainly one of the primary things is, is respect and admiration. So I thought I would review what it was that he thought was solved about this problem. And let me start by summarizing some of that. So first he said that the relation between D-wave superconductivity and antiferromagnetism is more or less understood. He said that TC is determined by phase ordering, not by pairing. He said that charge density wave orders and quantum oscillations occur in some regions of the phase diagram, but mostly above a very high critical magnetic field. He clearly didn't consider this to be extremely important. Uh, he said he understands the origin of the strange metal this is a part of the paper I don't understand. Uh, he says that there is some evidence of other subtle symmetry breaking, especially time reversal symmetry breaking, but that this cannot persist down to t equals zero because of the existence of sharp nodal gaps, uh, nodes in the gaps in the superconducting state. Uh, and he said there were several ideas about the coup rates that have been put forward that are easily falsified, including bipolaronic theories. 
there were a lot of things that he didn't mention at all, things that I uh, suppose he didn't consider central to the problem. There was no mention of spin liquids, no mention of emergent gauge fields, pair density waves, spin density waves, electron pneumatics, no mention of phonons, no mention of, uh, of um, solid state chemistry, oxygens, no mention of other materials like the nictides, no mention of holography or quantum critical points or the role of disorder or even RVB. Uh, some of these things I'm very wedded to, but more or less I'm going to follow Phil. I'm going to talk primarily about these first two points on which uh, I find I in considerable agreement. There was one other thing that he uh, took for granted and his discussion is framed in terms of this and he's articulated this in earlier papers, which is that in his opinion, the essential physics is captured in the Hubbard model so that the theoretician's task is to understand the Hubbard model. This doesn't mean that other interactions beyond the hub, doesn't mean that the Hubbard model is a microscopically realistic problem model. And it doesn't mean that some small wrinkles on this couldn't be important, but he identified this as the central theoretical problem. So I'm going to uh, discuss these aspects. I'm going to give my own uh, take on it, which uh, may well not be one that he would completely have uh, approved of, but I don't think it will be totally orthogonal to his perspective. So the other thing I looked at was a state of the field paper that was published uh, actually a year before that. I was one of the uh, co-authors on this. Um, we got together a group of people all who have been working on this subject more or less since its beginning. We all had very strong opinions and uh, insights into the problem. Uh, this is a paper that reads as if it was written by a committee because it was, but the advantage of that is that we hashed out our different uh, perspectives on it and arrived at at least a number of things that we all agreed were true about the uh, cuprates and the cuprate phase diagram. Um, this was five years ago. Uh, my first question to myself was, are there any things about the consensus we drew that I would like to change with the perspective of five more years of study? Uh, there are a few things at the time I wanted to call this strange metal phase a bad metal. I thought that was more descriptive. Since then, I've actually come to feel that the correct way of describing it is a still older term in terms of a marginal Fermi liquid. I'm not going to talk about that, but I thought I should mention that. The other thing is that uh, we had this bold statement that beyond the overdoped edge of the superconducting dome, the system was a Fermi liquid. And I'm a little bit less certain about that. I would probably now like to call it more like a Fermi liquid. Um, all right, but the main things that we concluded, we concluded that the nature of the D-wave superconducting state and its general relation to antiferromagnetism is broadly understood. Uh, we assumed that the superconducting TC is largely determined by phase ordering. So two things that really uh, agree with the previous take through the problem. And well, we did mention a lot of the other things that were unmentioned in the previous article. We said there was lots to be understood about the normal states, uh, the pseudo gap regime, the role of intertwined orders, for instance, pair density wave order, charge density wave order, spin density wave order, pneumatic order, the theory of the strange metal be flagged as being very central. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do now is to uh, start by giving you the arguments that I think support these first two conclusions. So 
let me start with the antiferromagnetic insulator. And there have been some recent interesting new discoveries about the properties of this antiferromagnetic insulator. Nonetheless, I would like to convince you that the undoped antiferromagnetic insulator is basically understood. And so first one observes that the insulating gap is much larger than the exchange energy J, and thus the description of it as a mod insulator, or more precisely, in terms of the physics of local moments on the copper sites is valid over a very broad range of energies below this insulating gap. So on at this, uh, on these range of energies, the system can be described as a spin a half Heisenberg model on a square lattice, possibly with second neighbor interactions or small ring exchange terms, but still basically the physics of a spin a half Heisenberg model on a square lattice. And the ground state has nail order. It's not close to being quantum disordered. Spin wave theory and the nonlinear sigma model give a remarkably good account of the basic physics of this state. There are, of course, possibilities of all sorts of interesting subtleties that can be caused by small terms that are missing from this description. One such effect that was uh, identified early on was the existence of metamagnetism due to a Jaloshinsky maria term and the canting of the magnets of the moments in LSCO. These are interesting things. These are things that we want to understand, but they're not things that, uh, that change our basic understanding of what's going on and what are the important low energy degrees of freedom in this problem. Um, so now let me go to D wave pairing and its relation to antiferromagnetism. So I'm going to now consider superconductivity as a weak coupling instability of a Fermi liquid. I'm going to talk a bit about this for a few minutes, uh, independent from the context of cuprate high temperature superconductivity. So in the weak coupling limit, we know that we can understand superconductivity very uh, precisely in terms of BCS mean field theory. We write down a gap equation, which is of this form. Delta is the superconducting gap. The sum occurs over states that are within some window lambda, assumed to be relatively narrow about the Fermi surface. V is some effective interaction in the uh, Cooper channel. And the solution of this equation gives us both TC and the structure of the gap in the superconducting state. Um, e is, of course, the spectrum of quasiparticles in the superconducting state. G, then we define a matrix G, which is a dimension, a, 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 a modified form of the effective interaction. And then the way we solve this equation, for instance, for TC, is we solve the eigenvalue equation, uh, treating G as a matrix. We order the eigenvalues. We find the largest eigenvalue, which we call lambda naught. If lambda naught's bigger than zero, then we have a superconducting state and TC goes like the cutoff times e to the minus one over lambda naught. Okay, so looking at this gap equation, uh, there are two uh, different extreme cases. If the interactions are attractive, that is to say if G is negative, then there's a perron frobenius theorem that tells us that the largest eigenstate is got all positive uh, amplitudes, and this gives rise to conventional superconductivity. If V is everywhere repulsive, then the sign preserving state cannot be the highest. The uh, sign changing state must be the uh, highest solution. And so we get unconventional superconductivity. Uh, for 
a cuprate type band structure, which I show here from some ARPUS experiment. Um, if one imagined having a repulsive interaction with a peak around pi pi, then you would want to have sign changes on the Fermi surface on going from the upper left-hand corner of this picture to the lower right-hand corner of this picture which is to say one would like to have a superconducting order parameter that changes sign across this diagonal line. And that's of course the D wave superconducting state that's seen in the cuprates. Um, it is intuitively uh, plausible that such a strong repulsive interaction at pi pi reflects the presence of short range antiferromagnetic correlations. And at the phenomenological level, this gives some understanding for why we have D wave superconductivity in the cuprates proximate to pi pi antiferromagnetism. Uh, interestingly, similar considerations seem to apply successfully to a host of other unconventional superconductors, the iron-based superconductors, the organic superconductors, I think probably strontium ruthenate, and uh, a, uh, uh, two very nice papers which um, track through the power of this analogy are a somewhat older paper by Doug Scalapino called The Common Thread, and a slightly more recent paper by Seamus Davis and Deng Hai Lee that again uh, pursued this idea. Um, so that's the BCS theory. The question of course arises, how do these interactions that, we en that enter the BCS gap equation arise? So for conventional superconductors, the issue is how does an attraction arise? The, in this case, the effective lambda is given by the difference between a phonon induced attraction and a, a bare electron electron repulsion. Uh, generally, you would expect that since electrons are like charged, that the repulsive interaction is stronger or at least as strong, uh, but uh, we understand how this gets modified doing a two-step renormalization group uh, uh, treatment of this problem. So first we in integrate out states between E Fermi and a cutoff, and that cutoff is the sort of typical or maybe largest phonon frequency. Um, in this process, the phonon induced attraction is at least perturbatively unrenormalized, but the electron electron repulsion gets reduced uh, due to this retardation factor. And so in particular, the renormalized electron electron repulsion is much less than the bare electron electron repulsion and therefore plausibly smaller, maybe even quite a bit smaller than the electron phonon induced attraction. So now in the second stage, we solve this problem using BCS theory with the cutoff being the phonon frequency and we get a conventional expression for TC. Uh, for unconventional superconductivity, we can ask how does this Q dependent repulsion arise? And we can approach this by a two-step normalization group description, very similar to that that's been applied to the electron phonon problem, uh, which was uh, set forward in this paper with uh, Doug Scalapino and Sri Raghu. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to integrate out degrees of freedom between E Fermi and some cutoff that's small compared to E Fermi. So we're going to be left only with a narrow shell of states about the Fermi energy. And if the interactions are weak, then we can carry this problem out just simply perturbatively, and we can get a new effective interaction at the scale lambda. And then in the second stage, we solve this using BCS mean field theory to get a TC 
that goes in the familiar way. However, in this case, our cutoff lambda is a computational device. It's not a physical scale. And so we better end up with a result that's independent of exactly where we choose to uh, go from the first stage of renormalization to the second stage. Okay, so let me show how this strategy works out in the context of the Hubbard model at small u. Uh, I'm going to be talking from time to time about the phase diagram of the Hubbard model, so let me introduce it here. Uh, here's the phase diagram. Uh, on the vertical axis is the strength of the interaction from zero to infinity. On the horizontal axis is the electron density per site going from one to something less than one. The uh, star in the middle there where U is on the order of the bandwidth and X is small but not too small, that's what we would really like to solve. That's the physics that we hope captures the physics of the high temperature superconductors, but it's not really solved in that region. So it's going to appear on future phase diagrams faintly reminding us that that's what we would really like to solve. But since we can't solve it, we're going to do solve everything but that region. And now let's look at what happens to this phase diagram in the weak coupling limit. And just for kicks, I'm going to imagine that we go away from the case where the Fermi surface is perfectly nested at half filling. So I'll imagine that there's a small uh, second neighbor hopping to make the band structure look a little bit more like the band structure of the cuprates. So in this case, there's a antiferromagnetic insulating state at half filling, but it gives way to a metallic state below some small but finite value of U. Uh, and uh, then uh, what's going to happen is that all along the small u axis of this phase diagram, we're going to find superconductivity, dx squared minus y squared superconductivity in a broad interesting region, and then maybe other forms of superconductivity at higher doping. And so how does this arise? So, um, so it arises as follows. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to integrate out degrees of freedom uh, down to a, a, a cutoff lambda and lambda is going to be smaller than u squared. So that means that it is indeed very small. It's going to be a small shell about the Fermi surface since we're solving this in the small u limit, but it's going to be larger than this e to the minus one over u factor that's the scale at which perturbation theory starts to break down. So as long as lambda is in this regime, we can integrate out the high energy degrees of freedom perturbatively, and we can get an effective interaction that we can compute uh, explicitly in powers of U times various correlation functions of the non-interacting system. So chi is going to embed the band structure information about the particular problem that we're studying. Chi is the particle hole susceptibility. Then we're going to plug this into the BCS gap equation and compute the largest eigenvalue lambda, which will depend on our cutoff. And it will start at order u squared. And then we'll have a series of terms of higher and higher order powers in u. Uh, we've given an explicit way to calculate the coefficient a and b. This, uh, the fourth order term has a logarithmically divergent part, which turns out to be important, but the higher, the non-divergent terms, uh, we don't really know how to compute. And so now I compute TC. In the second stage of renormalization, we plug this in and use BCS theory to compute TC. We get an expression like this, and this uh, u fourth term, the log divergent u fourth term, is just what's needed to cancel out any dependence on the result on lambda. We end up getting a TC that goes like e Fermi times e to the minus one over lambda, where lambda is uh, given by the first two terms in the above expansion. 
Uh, and of course, below TC, we can calculate the gap function uh, from the eigenvector that we found uh, in, in this process. All right, so at the end, what this means is that we can use a controlled solution to get a uh, expression for TC and for the character of the superconducting state valid at small u. The coefficients a and b in this expression can be calculated exactly from band structure properties of the non-interacting model. And so here's, for instance, the result for the nearest neighbor Hubbard model uh, on the uh, uh, x-axis is the electron density, unfortunately, with the direction uh, inverted. So n equals one, the half-filled band is at the right, uh, and uh, the density decreases as we move to the left. Uh, on the y-axis is the strength of the effective attract, uh, inter pairing interaction in units of u squared. So lambda is the density of states at the Fermi surface times this V effective. The different colors show different, uh, the largest eigenvalue in different symmetry channels. The uh, blue curve, which is the dominant one, is in the dx squared minus y squared channel. The red curve is in a G wave channel. The, uh, um, the uh, dashed curves are in various uh, P wave channels. Um, and so there's a big peak you can see in the effective uh, uh, interaction uh, near half filling in the uh, D wave channel. And of course, this goes exponentially into the expression for TC. So this means a much, much larger TC in this channel. Um, so, uh, uh, here's a picture of the density of states of this system. Blue is the relevant density of states for this problem. And you can see the divergence in the density of states at the Van Hove point at n equals one. Uh, in this particular problem, the Van Hove point and the point of perfect nesting where uh, uh, antiferromagnetic correlations are strongest coincide. And so it's a little bit hard to tell what it is that's causing this big enhancement of superconductivity near half filling. So I'm going to also show results for nearest neighbor hopping T prime equals minus 0.3. There, the red dashed curve shows the density of states in that case. The Van Hove point is displaced somewhat from N equals one. But now if we compute the uh, pairing uh, the effective uh, interaction in various channels, we get this expression. We still see a strong peak and enhancement of the pairing tendency in the D wave channel around N equals one. This is where the antiferromagnetic fluctuations are strongest. So this is really showing us the connection between this D wave pairing and some sort of short range antiferromagnetic fluctuations. Um, here's the uh, susceptibility, the particle hole susceptibility for this problem. N equals one is shown in red. And what you see is that there is not any, I mean, this is not on the verge of antiferromagnetic order but there's a factor of two enhancement of the susceptibility near pi pi relative to its value near zero. So this is some very short range antiferromagnetic correlations, but they're very powerful in inducing strong superconducting pairing. On the other hand, as we go far away from half filling, N equals 0.1 is shown as the blue, the pairing strength gets very strongly suppressed. Um, so uh, this leads to an aside. The, at the end of the day, the diagrams that we end up analyzing in this way are more or less the same as those analyzed by Cohn and Luttinger when they were discussing 
uh, uh, a mechanism of superconductivity of this sort. Um, the, there is a difference in emphasis. Uh, they focused on the effect of the existence of a sharp Fermi surface and is on Friedel oscillations as the source of the pairing. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is really a band structure effect. Chi is not the imaginary part of Chi, but the real part of Chi. So it comes from all energies, not particularly focused on the Fermi energy. And in particular, if we go to a case which is what happens is n goes to zero, where we have a, a circular Fermi surface, then um, in fact, it turns out the leading order term in this expression vanishes in two dimensions, despite the fact that there still is a sharp Fermi surface and Friedel oscillations. Um, okay, so, um, so we have a way of understanding the origin of D wave superconductivity in from repulsive interactions. We can solve it for the Hubbard model in a controlled Cohn-Luttinger like uh, way for small u. Uh, this is nice. It, uh, it explains the origin of D wave superconductivity and its relation to some sort of antiferromagnetic, short range antiferromagnetic correlations. Of course, there are many very serious problems with this as a theory of high TC in the cuprates. In this case, the normal state is an exquisitely good Fermi liquid. TC is extremely small. The range of superconducting fluctuations above TC is extremely small. There are no local moments, no magnetism. There's no charge density waves. There's no intertwined orders. So much of the physics is, is missing. There are other paths through this same problem. There are various ways of resumming perturbation theory. There's RPA, there's functional renormalization group, there's dynamical cluster approximation. These all give results that are similar. In fact, they more or less, I think, reduce to the small u expressions in small u, but they make an attempt to uh, incorporate the physics of intermediate use in some uh, serious fashion, uh, but maintaining the same insights that I've just discussed. There's another version that's sort of morally similar to this, which is pairing mediated by nearly quantum critical fluctuations, and that has a different set of possible control parameters, proximity to the critical point being the small parameter rather than small u. Um, this approach definitely has some advantages and its, its insights aren't all that far from the same, but uh, in it has serious problems with it. So certainly in near optimally dope, whole doped cuprates, the antiferromagnetic correlations are at most on the order of one lattice constant. So there's no way one can think about this as being anywhere near an antiferromagnetic quantum critical point. Uh, it may be a better description of the electron doped coupe rates. Um, in optimal TC in the iron based superconductors shows some evidence of always being in proximity to a pneumatic quantum critical point. So maybe that has some role to play there. Uh, certainly in some heavy fermion superconductors, this sort of idea uh, seems to be uh, very useful. Okay, but so um, what I would claim is that this weak coupling perspective gives us an understanding of the origin of D wave pairing in the sense of adiabatic continuity. That is to say, on this phase diagram, we very ro robustly see that we get D wave superconductivity in this small u region. And then we can argue that if we're lucky and if the physics continues smoothly from small u to intermediate u, then although we don't have a quantitatively controlled theory at intermediate u, we still have some general understanding of this basic point. Okay, so now let me go to the second topic. Phase ordering determines TC. 
So, um, so let me think about the physics of TC, not as an instability of a Fermi liquid, but let me imagine starting with information about the superconducting ground state and then asking the question, based on that information, what would I predict TC to be? When will thermal fluctuations destroy superconducting phase coherence? So, well, one thing is we might look at the quasi-particle excitation spectrum, and we might from that uh, estimate a typical gap value. And as in BCS theory, we would then estimate the TC is going to be something like a half of the gap value. Um, and the intuition there is that this is the energy scale that, um, that characterizes the binding of electrons into Cooper pairs. And so TC would be the point at which the pairs fall apart. Now, the other thing we have is uh, collective excitations of the system. There is a phase degree of freedom that's described at low temperature by a nonlinear sigma model. And the stiffness in this kappa is often expressed as a superfluid density, rho s, divided by a mass, m star. Really, the quantity is kappa, but it's intuitively easier to think about it as a superfluid density over an effective mass. And now from that, we can make a uh, temperature scale or energy scale, which is kappa times some microscopic length L, which we'll worry about later, but this has units of energy. And so we would say that when the temperature gets to be of order T theta, then phase fluctuations become sufficiently violent that they're likely to destroy the superconducting coherent state. Um, we can estimate uh, crudely what we would expect this scale to be. We'll take the superfluid density to be a half the density of electrons, half because they pair up to form Cooper pairs. We take the density of electrons to be something like one over a lattice constant cubed. We'll take the effective mass to be twice the electron mass for the same reason. <laughs> I don't know why I kept all these twos, but I did. And so this gives us a value of T theta that's 10 to the fourth Kelvin times uh, the one over the lattice constant in units of angstroms and this length L in units of the lattice constant. And so obviously this is a very high temperature. It doesn't have anything to do with the physics of TC in conventional superconductors. Now in the underdoped cuprates, the density of electrons, or the density of holes rather, is rather smaller. First place, the lattice constants of the cuprates tend to be rather big. Uh, second place, as we'll see, it's reasonable to replace this length scale L by the lattice constant in the C direction. And finally, there's physics that says that the density, the effective density of holes should be the density of doped holes X rather than the band structure density of holes uh, one plus X. And putting these together, we get a estimate of T theta without you know, doing anything else that's something like 1500 times X, which means that for X, in say the underdoped range, we get a a priori estimate of T theta that's on the order of TC. And what this tells us is without any other considerations, phase fluctuations are certainly going to be many orders of magnitude more important in the cuprates than they are in conventional superconductors. I don't, I didn't know, know if I heard somebody wanting to ask a question. I don't know how questions are handled, uh, but I assume that anybody that wants to ask a question will just speak up. Uh, so far, there is no question. Okay. Actually, uh, Steve, just for clarity, sorry, this is Andrei Nevedomsky. Could you clarify what little L is? Is that a typical coherence in the third direction? So I'm going to discuss what L is. L, right now, I just pulled L out. It's needed for by dimensional analysis to get a a value of T theta. So in different circumstances, L will take on different values. So certainly if I had a 
uh, bulk three-dimensional superconductor. L then is the shortest distance scale on which this nonlinear sigma model description is valid. So L will be something on the order of the coherence length. On the other hand, in the coup rates, which are layered, what I'll show you, what I'll argue is that L should be on the order of the spacing between layers, since the coherence length in the C direction is on the order of the distance between layers. Thanks so okay. much. Okay, so um, I pulled out of the hat that the superfluid density should be proportional to the density of doped holes, but in fact, measured values of this quantity, which are measured through measurements of the uh, London penetration depth, show that the superfluid density is, at least in some range of doping, on the order of x rather than 1 plus x, which means an order of magnitude reduction in the superfluid stiffness. We'll return uh, eventually to the question of why rho s is so small, but for now, let's just take that as an experimental fact. Um, so, um, so what this means is that phase fluctuations are important and uh, Vic Emery and I propose that we should in fact view it as a, not only uh, uh, some sort of upper bound on TC, but one that actually uh, means something in the context of the coup rates. And so we proposed that you should look at the physics of um, TC uh, in, in this way, as we dope the system, we have an increasing superfluid density. So this energy scale T theta is going to be increasing. Uh, we have a pairing scale that's somehow related to proximity to antiferromagnetism. So it's going to drop as we increase doping. Uh, these two curves will cross. The actual superconducting TC will be bounded above by these two lines. And so we'll have a crossover at optimal doping from a phase ordering dominated regime at low doping to a pairing dominated regime at high doping. Um, and uh, so uh, that was a long time ago. What's wrong with this picture? Um, so first place, there's an issue that was clear at the time, which is that our picture was wrong at small x. Well, you can see here that our dashed line only goes to zero at, P, at x equals zero, whereas the actual superconducting TC goes to zero at some minimum doping. Um, we said some words about that. That's probably associated with quantum phase fluctuations and possibly with the approach to a quantum superconductor to insulator transition. So that's okay. Uh, there was something else which was already known, which was called the so-called boomerang effect, which was that the superfluid density increases with increasing doping to something a little past optimal doping, but then it tends to drop again as one approaches the overdoped side of the superconducting dome. And so, uh, in fact, we quoted some numbers. We computed the T theta over TC was about one in optimally doped LSCO, and it had risen to three and a half in overdoped thallium-2201. Three and a half is certainly bigger than one. It suggests that maybe phase fluctuations are less fully dominant in this case than they are in the underdoped regime. On the other hand, there's no evidence that this ratio is diverging as our simple cartoon uh, would have suggested. More recently, this has come into very close, uh, uh, into very uh, uh, clear focus in some interesting work by Ivan Bozovich on a series of lanthanum strontium copper oxide films. So what's shown here in blue is uh, a set of films TC versus superfluid density expressed in units of temperature as I uh, have done here with L taken to be the C axis lattice constant. 
And these are TC dropping as one approaches the overdoped side of the superconducting dome. So one sees that TC and the superfluid density are dropping more or less in tandem with each other. Shown in red and green, but why don't you ignore the red, are uh, earlier data from uh, uh, Bruin et al on underdoped YBCO as one approaches the underdoped side of the superconducting dome. In the green, what's being taken as L is the lattice constant, so the distance between bilayers in YBCO. And what one sees is that both qualitatively, but spectacularly, even quantitatively, the relation between TC and the superfluid density looks pretty similar on both sides of the superconducting dome, at least in these two materials. Um, so, um, uh, let's see, I already said that. Okay, so can we update this picture? So first, let's just draw in lines that correspond to experimental facts. We still have a superconducting dome. Uh, probably we have antiferromagnetism of some sort or other, uh, maybe long range, maybe short range uh, over here to the left of the superconducting dome. We have various measures of the density of mobile carriers which somehow do seem to sort of grow monotonically with doping. We do have measures of the superconducting gap that show that it tends to drop, but not maybe quite as aggressively as in the initial sketch that Vic Emery and I made. And we have a superfluid density that while it's larger relative to TC on the overdoped side than on the underdoped side, seems to always be on the order of TC over the whole range of the uh, superconducting dome. So, um, so good, that's, that's empirical facts. Um, it still begs the question, why is the T equals zero superfluid density so small? And why in particular for small x, is it proportional to the density of doped holes, not to the band structure density of holes? Um, and then the other question, the question that I think has been most vexed uh, in the discussion of this problem over many years is, can we associate precursor pairing with some or all of the observed pseudo gap? And certainly over the, uh, uh, past 20 years, there have been an enormous number of papers that have proven that precursor pairing explains everything about the pseudo gap. And there have been an even larger number of papers that have proved that it shows nothing about the pseudo gap. So this is certainly a vexed problem that I'll, uh, I'll need to address. So why is the superfluid density so small? Well, there are a couple of, of interesting ways one could think about this. One is the sort of the original RVB insulator of viewing the doped system as a doped spin liquid. So let's now uh, allow our imagination to draw a phase diagram rather than actual calculations. We can imagine that on the uh, undoped axis, we have an antiferromagnetic insulator, but that uh, uh, the transition from the antiferromagnetic insulator to the conducting state uh, occurs through a sequence of two phase transitions uh, where the interactions are more frustrated and in which perhaps there's a quantum spin liquid phase. And then we can approach the quantum spin liquid phase since there's no broken symmetry in it. We can imagine approaching it from the superconducting state continuously. Indeed, one of the ways to think about at least some classes of quantum spin liquids is as quantum disordered superconductors. So in this way, we would have a superconducting state which would have a superfluid density that would approach zero continuously as X goes to zero. 
And so there is an obvious reason why it would be small for small x. Now, uh, of course, in the real materials, we start in an antiferromagnetic insulating phase. And so you might think that the best way to understand the superconducting phase that occurs at intermediate coupling would be to follow this trajectory through uh, parameter space. But since the antiferromagnetism has to go away, we're it's going to have to cross one or more phase transitions on the way to this. So this route is conceptually complicated. In fact, I think there's good reason to think that there may be first order, at least one first order transition barring the evolution in this direction. And therefore it's not unreasonable to want to approach the interesting regime at, from a route which allows us to do it without crossing any unnecessary phase boundaries. So there's another uh, uh, set of ideas for why the superfluid density may be so small, which has to do with intertwined orders and or the proximity to a superconductor to insulator transition at the underdoped side of the phase diagram. So coming back to this phase diagram, there's this intermediate regime, which it's not unknown because it hasn't been studied. It's unknown because it's very complicated. It turns out that in this intermediate regime, Numerical studies show very clearly very strong tendencies, but to many different types of ordered states. There's strong indications of D wave superconductivity, but there's also striped SDW order, spin density wave order, striped charge density wave order uh, associated with stripes. There's pneumatic order. There's various coexisting patterns of these for which evidence exists, charge density wave and superconductivity, spin density wave and superconductivity. The reason we haven't sorted out what the exact phase diagram here is, is because the balance between these different phases is so delicate that it's very hard to determine. However, along with this comes the obvious statement that competition, at least the competition with charge density wave is going to tend to reduce the superfluid density and can lead to a superconductor to insulator transition. So if electrons are condensed into the charge density wave, then they're not condensed into the superconducting condensate. Uh, there's another idea that has been put forward, which is that you should understand this at, in terms of bipolarons and some sort of BCS to BEC crossover. This is one of the ideas that uh, Phil Anderson in the paper I discussed at the beginning said has been falsified and I agree with that. So first place, there's a general uh, observation that to get bipolarons, one needs strong attraction and the only obvious source of strong attraction in electronic systems is from strong electron phonon coupling. And that leads to huge mass renormalizations. Bipolarons always, okay, this is not supposed to be a theorem. This is a prejudice, always localize or crystallize. Um, in particular for a D-wave superconductor, the BCS to BEC is not a crossover, it's a phase transition. And we certainly know we're on the BCS side of the phase transition. We're not even close. Uh, the chemical potential in a BEC drops below the band edge. In the cuprates, the chemical potential is just where band theory expect, predicts it to be. And moreover, the normal state is full of gapless excitations with the quantum numbers of electrons and even conventional quantum oscillations have been seen. Uh, on the overdoped side of the dome, there's, uh, there's ongoing discussion about what's going on. Certainly disorder must play a role in the reduction of the superfluid density. Uh, uh, in this paper that's on the archive uh, in collaboration with uh, Lee and Lee, um, we proposed that what's going on it has to do with self-organized granularity proximate to 
a quantum disorder driven superconductor to metal transition. I won't have time to talk to discuss that. And that certainly this part of the phase diagram is still very much open. Okay, so, um, so that's good. I think we have at least several ways to understand where the small superfluid density comes from. Uh, now we come to the more vexed question of, can we associate precursor pairing with some or all of the pseudo gap? Or let me reframe that. How can we determine even, what does this question even mean? How can we determine whether the pseudo gap is a precursor superconducting gap or not? After all, gaps don't come labeled with their origin. So near TC, uh, where superconducting correlations are substantial, uh, there should be strong superconducting fluctuation effects. And this, this is unambiguously true. There are clearly identifiable superconducting fluctuation effects that are seen in some range of temperatures above TC, typically on the order of 30 Kelvin above TC or so. There's strong fluctuation diamagnetism. There's a vortex Nernst signal. Uh, there's an anomalous peak in the low frequency optical conductivity. There are particle hole symmetric features in ARPAS spectrum. There are uh, quasi particle interference patterns that are easily identifiable as being due to Bogolov de Gen quasi particles that are observable in STM. There are non-equilibrium signatures such as charge 2E shot noise. There are a number of other such things that I think are unambiguously superconducting fluctuation effects. But these are seen in a range of temperatures that are enormous compared to the fluctuation effects that are seen in conventional superconductors. And so extremely notable and, and something that uh, that one should say is special about the coup rates, but certainly not over ranges of temperatures that are comparable to the pseudo gap crossover T star. So that's, that's sort of unambiguous. Now, the gap like features uh, persist in various spectroscopies, especially ARPUS, up to temperatures of order some T star, which can be two or even 10 times TC. And so now the question is, oh, can we associate these gap-like features with precursor pairing? And there are some reasons to think that maybe one can. So first place, this pseudo gap has a, I call it a magnitude of D wave form. That is to say, the pseudo gap is certainly larger out near the antinodal regions where the D wave gap has its maximum and smaller in the nodal direction where, or even vanishing in the nodal direction where the D wave gap has its nodes. Um, however, it's not even really clear what you mean by this gap. In ARPUS, at least, there are no coherent quasi-particle peaks. So it's some uh, recession of spectral weight from the Fermi energy rather than the position of a well-defined quasi-particle. So it's a little bit hard to know just what to say about this gap. On the other hand, as one cools below TC, a quasi-particle peak does appear. It appears with an energy that's roughly equal to the pseudo gap energy. And this evolves into a nice D wave quasi-particle at temperatures much below TC. So there's some argument on continuity that maybe the pseudo gap and the gap below TC, the superconducting gap, are somehow linked to each other. Um, but there's a question one might want to ask, uh, which is, can one in any way see whether this gap is really D wave like in the sense that something is changing sign as one goes, for instance, from the pi zero point to the zero pi point. Um, and so, in this regard, there's been a recent experiment uh, on, well, and, uh, and earlier experiments as well 
on the so-called resonant mode. So let me just remind you briefly of, again, the weak coupling theory of the resonant mode, which was worked out long ago by Balut and Scalapino and others. And so the idea here is if in the superconducting state, if you calculate the spin susceptibility at an ordering vector Q, uh, you find that it's, uh, you can have a bound state. Uh, the bound state will be at some energy that's shifted down from the twice the gap by some small amount due to interactions, but that the weight of this mode will depend on superconducting coherence factors. And in particular, if uh, this factor, if we uh, look at the contribution from K sub antinode, that means quasi particle at one of the antinodes, then you can see that this coherence factor is plus one if the order parameter has the same sign at both antinodes. So the full term in brackets vanishes. That is to say, this quantity would vanish for a sign preserving gap. On the other hand, if the gap changes sign in going from one antinode to the other, then this factor is plus two. And so the presence of this antinode is, was one of the early pieces of evidence in favor of D-wave superconductivity because it measured the change in the sign of the gap from one antinode to the other. So here's some recent data that uh, from Bernard Keimer. He's talked about it. He promises that it will be posted sometime soon, but, uh, but at any rate, here it is. I'm going to uh, walk you through it. So in the upper right-hand corner, figure B shows you the sample on the sample holder. It's a mosaic of many different uh, YBCO crystals. Uh, the panel C shows you the range of TCs of these crystals. So these are underdoped crystals with TCs uh, just a little bit above 60 Kelvin. Um, now, going to the upper left-hand corner, panel D, you can see at 3 Kelvin, this is a picture of the neutron scattering intensity near the pi pi point in the Brillouin zone. The vertical axis is the energy and the horizontal axis is deviation from the pi pi point in one of the crystallographic directions. The uh, dark red circle is the famous resonance peak. It's sharp both in energy and in momentum. Uh, now, 66 Kelvin is just a little bit above TC. And what you see is that this resonant peak uh, persists. And it shifts to slightly lower energy, only, only very slightly. It broadens well, considerably, but it turns out its integrated intensity is the same at 66 Kelvin and at 3 Kelvin. And indeed, the integrated intensity uh, remains more or less constant. Uh, of course, as the peak gets broader and broader, exactly what you're integrating is going to get a little bit more complicated. But within experimental uncertainty, the integrated weight in this peak seems to stay constant all the way up to T star. So, so that's, that's striking. The weight of this peak is supposed to depend in the superconducting state on the sign change of the superconducting gap. So this persistence with undiminished weight up to T star is suggestive that at least that the pseudo gap has some of the same sign structure as the superconducting gap. All right, so that's, that's the strongest argument I know in favor of identifying the pseudo gap with preformed pairs without any phase coherence. Of course, this isn't completely convincing. There is an awful lot that's going on in the pseudo gap regime. There are various other forms of intertwined orders that occur 
in substantial portions of the pseudo gap regime. Uh, Eduardo Fratkin talked about this and, and other people have mentioned it as well. Uh, these certainly have important effects in this regime. I think it's unlikely that any single simple explanation is going to capture the full complexity of this regime. Um, I'm sort of running late, so I'm going to um, I'm going to skip my discussion of time reversal symmetry breaking. Uh, let me um, let me go. So let me. Yeah, yes, I'll, I'll, you still have like more than twenty minutes, uh, so you should have time. Ah, okay. Uh, a, a question, Steve. Yes. Um, if there is a symmetry breaking at T star, is obviously not one of the intertwined orders that you are speaking about. Uh, can one sensibly discuss the problems you've been discussing, uh, it, it, not, not recognizing that there is a symmetry breaking below T star of some other kind? So, um, so it's a good question. And let me let me put it aside for now. Let me let me finish my talk, and then I will come back to that. Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the answer to this. Uh, that's the part I skipped over. Let me let me finish the talk to to finish the logic, and then I will address that. Is that okay? Okay. Good. Um. So um. Good. Let's see. So where was I? Yeah. So I I think that I think that this is good. Let me let me first summarize what I what I think I've said, uh, what the conclusions I would like you to take away, and and then we can discuss this uh, in the in the discussion section. So first, let me summarize what I think we know about the phase diagram of the Hubbard model on the square lattice. Here, just for concreteness, I've decided to sketch it in the case where T prime is zero, where the antiferromagnetic insulating phase extends all the way from U equals infinity down to U equals one at half filling. And so I've already shown you that at low uh, small u, we have superconducting phases that we can understand very well. It turns out that at large u, you can do numerics and there's no uh, intertwined orders. There's no competing orders. The numerics are very clear uh, and converged. And so although this isn't, uh, this isn't anything analytic, I think it's pretty clear that what we get at low doping and u near infinity is a fully polarized ferromagnetic metal state if you want the Nagaoka state where the holes are delocalized and they produce ferromagnetism. And then there's some other wrinkles on that. There's some regions of phase separation and there's some interesting charge and spin density waves orders that occur even at U equals infinity. There is a very interesting and complex region that I think is still not well understood in which one looks at the properties of a lightly doped antiferromagnetic insulator. Uh, the best Hartree-Fox solutions here are stripes. There's uh, considerable evidence of a tendency towards phase separation. There's anyway, some narrow region over there where antiferromagnetism is strong and the uh, doped holes live in a background that has substantial antiferromagnetic order. And then in this intermediate region, there are uh, many different numerical studies that end up giving somewhat different conclusions about the problem. They all agree, or they mostly agree, on what the actors here are. So there's strong indications that there is a tendency towards D-wave superconductivity. Uh, there's certainly D-wave pairing, whether there's D-wave long range order or not and how that depends on details like the value of T prime is still being sorted out. There's strong tendencies towards stripe spin density wave order. 
towards stripe chart density wave order, towards pneumatic order, and towards various coexisting phases. Um, right. So what's known about the phase diagram of the cuprates? So I hope I've convinced you that the general nature of the D-wave superconducting state and its relation to antiferromagnetism is broadly understood. I think that the superconducting TC is strongly affected by phase fluctuations over the whole range of the, of the phase diagram. It's uh, clearly more tightly linked with the phase ordering temperature in the underdoped region than in the overdoped region, but phase fluctuations are an order one effect over the whole phase diagram. And there is a remarkable similarity with the phase diagram of simple Hubbard models with the cuprates, that many of the tendencies, the types of order and the ordering tendencies that we know from the cuprates also show up very clearly and unavoidably in serious solutions of the Hubbard model. But there's a lot to be understood about the nature of this phase diagram. There's a lot to be understood about the role of intertwined orders, whether pair density waves uh, are important, charge density waves, spin density waves, pneumatic order, what the nature of the time reversal symmetry breaking that occurs, the nature of the marginal Fermi liquid. Let me end by one, uh, by focusing on one of the not solved problems that I think is most important and most interesting, which is that why it is that this phase diagram is so complicated. So the, the thing that's striking about the phase di or one of the things that's striking about the phase diagram of the cuprates and of many of these highly correlated uh, uh, materials that we've been studying recently is precisely this fact that their phase diagrams are so complicated, that there are so many different forms of electronic order that over a broad range of parameters in the phase diagram seem to be uh, occurring with similar energy scales and temperature scales. Uh, you know, in if you just think abstractly about phase diagrams, you might think that near a fine-tuned multi-critical point, you might have two orders that are, well, equal to each other in strength, they have the same TCs, but this typically is thought to require fine tuning. In the cuprates, these massive different types of, of ordering tendencies are seen over a broad range of materials, a broad range of doping, a broad range of temperatures. So it's not that the circumstances aren't fine tuned, but they're only slightly fine tuned. They're fine tuned in the sense that we're studying materials that exhibit high temperature superconductivity that presumably tells us something about the material, but it's not that a parameter has been consciously tuned to tune the system to a multi-critical point. So, uh, okay, so, and so that's the fine tuning in materials and in the, uh, in the numerical studies on the Hubbard model, it's also fine tuned in the sense that this statement applies only when U is on the order of the bandwidth. That is to say, when the system is in some sense maximally quantum frustrated. It doesn't, it isn't dominated either by the classical interactions between particles or by the quantum band structure of the particles. These two energies are equal to each other and what seems to happen then is that in this case, the system just doesn't know what to do. All right, so that's my end. Uh, let me stop for a minute and then I'll, I'll address Chandra's question. Um, uh, thanks, Steve, for a very great talk. Okay, so Chandra. So... Hey. So, okay, so there certainly is evidence 
of time reversal symmetry breaking at T star. And this is certainly important and interesting. Uh, there certainly is evidence of other types of symmetry breaking at T star as well. Uh, for instance, in lanthanum strontium copper oxide on scales on the order of T star, there is a tetragonal to orthorhombic transition. Now, in the case of LSCO, nobody thinks that that's important for the pseudo gap. I don't either. Um, but it's an illustration that uh, one can um, have sharp things like phase transitions, uh, which, of course, they have a very big advantage over many of the things I've talked about, which is they have a precise characterization. There is a transition. The nature of the symmetry breaking across the transition is unambiguous and undebatable. And therefore, there are certainly things we should understand. But there's also a question. It's actually the question that you've raised many times about the importance of charge density wave order or pneumatic order, which is, is it somehow big enough to affect the very large changes that are, uh, that are characteristic of the pseudo gap? So here, uh, I think the answer is still unknown, but let me explain why I'm overall uh, doubtful that time reversal symmetry breaking at T star is the origin of the pseudo gap. And there are two things. So the first is that NMR sees no evidence of it. And so NMR is a local probe um, and uh, of course has some uh, uh, resolution, but if this was a big enough order to, um, to cause the pseudo gap, I find it very hard to understand how it could be invisible to NMR. And the second thing is the point that actually uh, was made in Phil's paper and was uh, discussed uh, by Erisberg and me uh, quite some time ago, which is that if one has time reversal symmetry breaking, then the D wave nodal spectrum uh, is unstable. Now, of course, there's always a quantitative issue here. Um, the, the destruction of the D-wave nodal spectrum could be small if the time reversal symmetry uh, breaking is extremely weak or extremely weakly coupled to the quasi-particles. But if it's so extremely weakly coupled to the quasi-particles, I don't understand how it can be the origin of the pseudo gap. So that's my tentative answer at this point. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, irrespective of what precisely the order is at T star, there's a simple thing one can do, which is to integrate from the specific heat data. Integration from the specific heat data gives you an experimental measure of the free energy involved due to the transition. And then you discover that associated with what happens below T star is a factor of 10. And in some of the instances of what you call intertwined order, a factor of 100 larger effect than, uh, the, uh, than the other intertwined orders. It is in fact uh, so large that I believe it is impossible to have a discussion of the issues that you talked about uh, in uh, ignoring it. Okay, I know you do. I disagree. You 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 disagree with thermodynamics then? Yeah, I. <laughs> Uh, Chandra, uh, can you clarify your statement that there's a large change of specific heat? Is that an experimental statement or? Oh, yeah, it's an experimental statement. There are, there are experiments on specific heat? Below, let's say, let's say you are 10 or 12% or 15%. Yeah. And you just look at the 
change of the specific heat occurring starting from T star and go down below and integrate over it, you know. The, yeah, but there's no sign of T star. Specific heat is the derivative of energy with respect to temperature. So if you integrate it, you get the idea of uh, what the uh, what the energy reduction would be compared to what you would expect if you were continuing from about T star up to T star. Okay, and and if you if you extrapolate that all the way down, you look at the difference of that from the experiment. That is the basis of my statement. And then you see that uh, these other orders that one is talking about it, are invisible in the specific heat data. And indeed, as far as charge density wave is concerned, you, we have a direct measure from the, uh, the largest amplitude of the charge density wave that one has ever seen in a magnetic field. Uh, uh, you can get a scale. But yeah. I'm you saying can't, Chandra, that's just wrong. <laughs> simply no, I just want to clarify that. the experimental statement. Yeah. You're saying that there is a good enough data that goes up to 150 yes. Kelvin in specific heat that you can integrate it. Yes. And you want to integrate it down to TC, the superconducting TC or what? Let us, let us integrate it down to superconducting TC. Okay, and you say that there's a big entropy through that region. There is a big energy change. Yeah, but you know, that's a big temperature range. So anything, anything would have a big so you, entropy you, change, you regardless of what kind of order. Kelvin, 200 Kelvin to 50 Kelvin. Yeah. Okay, in YBCO, the, yeah. the specific heat, which is derivative of energy with respect to temperature. Yeah. And you get a measure. Yeah. I, so I don't you can't measure is relative to anything else because yeah, that's I mean, what you measure. Everything is changing. Yeah. It's measuring yeah. relative to a constant density of states or whatever is happening about T star. You have you have the data about T star as well. Yeah, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, maybe we, we should discuss this later offline. So yeah, we should give opportunity. I just don't understand. Not to, not to say that you're wrong. So there is a person raises his hand or her hand. Uh, Anas, can you ask the question now? Uh, yes. Um, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, th there is a recent paper of using uh, quantum Monte Carlo and uh, DMRG. It's uh, stated that absence of superconductivity in pure two-dimensional Hubble model. And uh, as a Mr. understanding, I'm new in this field. Uh, you, you discuss uh, this model, uh, Yes. Uh, so, so uh, the, the, this this uh, paper is uh, dealing with the moderate to strong coupling regime at, at, at uh, close to the optimal do, uh, doping. Uh, so, I just want to uh, get rid of this confusion of my head. Right. So that's in this intermediate coupling regime. Um, so it's used like eight, which is the bandwidth. And uh, there's, and this is, I mean, the, 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 the best calculations there are DMRG calculations. Um, DMRG calculations on four leg cylinders show superconducting order, but it's of a sort of weird sort. It's a D wave about the center of the cylinder. Um, uh, evidence on somewhat broader ladders is that probably charge density wave order dominates. Um, there has been arguments that as you turn up T prime that you can switch the balance between these things. But I think that the true statement is what I made here, which is that in this intermediate coupling regime, you certainly see strong tendencies towards all of these orders and exactly which one is dominant is going to take us still quite a while to sort out. So for instance, uh, if you have a close competition between D-wave superconductivity and stripe-like charge density waves, then putting the system into a one-dimensional geometry, which you have to do to do DMRG, tends to stabilize the charge density wave. So the charge density wave they find in that study that you're referring to is not only a charge density wave, but it's an insulating charge density wave. 
Um, it's a charge density wave that looks in some ways like the Hartree-Fock charge density waves. Um, other studies for non-zero T prime have reported evidence of uh, a different type of interplay between charge density wave with a different period and superconductivity with long superconducting correlations. Uh, I think it's actually too early to, I mean, even after a third of a century, to definitively conclude in which values of T prime and which values of U at intermediate coupling is the system superconducting and in which values does, is it dominated by some of these other orders. What is clear is, well, first place I claim the low U part of this phase diagram is clear. Uh, and uh, that's much harder to address numerically because the length scales are so long. But as far as I know, there's no debate about the nature of the phase diagram at small u. And at large u, uh, well, there is convergence. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be forever that we won't know the phase diagram, but I'm pretty sure that what we'll find is that depending upon details of the band structure, we'll find that some or all of these phases are realized in different portions of the intermediate coupling regime. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the next one is Igor. Igor, you can ask the question. Oh, hi, Steve. Uh, thanks a lot for a great talk. I have a question which is to an extent follow up on Chandra's question, but and on your answer to his question, and that relates to the lattice and the tetragonal to electronic transition. Uh, okay, so at the end of the day, this is a perovskite. So at least at uh, uh, you know half filling, so in, in the insulating state, it is a perovskite. It has this perovskite physics where you have these floppy phonon modes, which actually stabilize high temperature tetragonal structure. And so they carry enormous amount of entropy and their results from a fine balance of Coulomb interactions. Uh, so, but in Hubbard models, of course, you treat it as a rigid lattice. And so, uh, it is all discarded. And of course, when you say that this transition is not important, uh, so somehow I feel that, I, I, again, I have no opinion on that. I, it's, a, it's a question. Are there reasons to really discard it? No. So so look, um, I, complete, I completely agree with you that uh, there are important phonon effects in the materials. Uh, their quantitative effects are enormous. The electron phonon coupling is extremely strong that can be, uh, be documented. In fact, that's why Muller was looking at these materials. Um, so in order to understand the, uh, the experiments in the materials, there's no question in my mind that phonons are going to play an important role. Uh, and uh, this is true of the transport, and this is a true certainly of the charge and spin density wave ordering, which are very directly coupled to phonons. Um, so, so it's a little bit of a question of what one means by understanding. So what my hope is, is that by studying the Hubbard model or some appropriate simple stripped down electronic model, we'll be able to understand some caricature of what's going on in the cuprate, some cuprates, some essence of the physics. So since prominent in the physics are uh, antiferromagnetism and D-wave superconductivity, there's no doubt in my mind that the strong repulsive interactions are necessary. The question of whether one can omit the phonons and obtain a first crude understanding of what's going on and then put back in the effects of phonons when trying to make a more direct comparison between theory and experiment. That's the sort of the optimistic view. The more uh, solid state view is to say, look, we know that these structural transitions are all over the place in the phase diagram that phonon effects are, uh, are observed and are dramatic, and that maybe by ignoring phonons, we're not even looking at the right zeroth order problem. That's still possible. Uh, my, my evidence 
that the Hubbard model is good is just that remarkably, even though this model is so stripped down and so simple, all of these orders that, or many of these orders that have been being discovered in the last uh, decade or two, uh, in addition to the D, well, the D wave superconductivity is there and well, charge and spin density wave orders that are similar to those found in the cuprate in the Hubbard model are showing up in the cuprates. This is sort of encouraging that at least we're not looking at totally the wrong problem. Was that okay, a did much. that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think yeah, I, I think that if I may rephrase it in one sentence, the answer I think is very reasonable. You assume that these phonons, even though they are important and, and mighty in, in perovskites, but for the purposes of superconductivity, can be integrated out without impacting the basic uh, physics of the superconductivity. And this is just an assumption. Yeah, it's not. I mean, that that sounds bolder than it. Oh, okay. Then is justified. I mean, you know, the phonons have frequencies that are of order the superconducting gap. Right. So you yeah. can't, you know, if they were high energy modes, you could integrate them out and say, okay, they just turn into some effective renormalization of the interactions. If they were low energy modes, you could say, okay, they're they're everything's going to follow them adiabatically. We can ignore them. The fact that they have energy scales on the order of the gap means there's no actual formal justification for integrating them out or ignoring them. Right. It's, it's, it's not, it, the argument is much, uh, much less good than that and much vaguer. It's that uh, I want to study a simple model, not one that I could derive from the physics of the cuprates, but one which has enough of the physics of the cuprates that I hope I'm learning something. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so this is just an assumption in, in other words. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's what I understood. Thank, th thank you very much. Okay, uh, the next one is Frank Zhao. Frank. Uh, great, thanks for the talk. Um, so where are we in terms of real materials and what, what access to this uh, phase diagram do we have in these crystals? Like, can you relate the theoretical phase diagram in this Hubbard model to the phase diagram we see in the review papers? Yeah, no. Um, you know, I think that's asking too much of this model. So as, as we've just been discussing, this model is, it's really uh, not a model of the cuprates. It's a model of the interaction between itinerant electrons and antiferromagnetism. And so uh, I think the comparison one should be making are, do we see some of the same physics here? You know, in, in discussing the phase diagram of the cuprates, we need to take more phenomenological approaches, writing down, you know, I mean, a lot of progress you can make just by looking at something like Landau-Ginzburg theory in terms of the known uh, order parameters, and you can understand quite a bit about the phase diagram on these bases. Uh, it, it, the, the microscopic details are, are very complicated. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 we've just mentioned that phonons, which are important, are missing here. There's also clearly important physics of the local quantum chemistry, the fact that you have copper and oxygen orbitals that have uh, close by energies and that the whole doped holes go on the oxygen. These are all important features of the actual materials that are completely absent in the Hubbard model. So trying to do something too precise in terms of comparing uh, a calculation on the Hubbard model with a measurement on the cuprates doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Great, thanks. Uh, okay, the next one is the revise. Uh, revise, you can ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk, Professor Kittleson. Uh, to you, what's the order of priorities in in, in the outstanding yeah. questions. You, you told us what, in your view, has been understood. Mm -hmm. what, what's the yeah, order of right. priorities for the rest? So, 
So certainly one of the things that is a, for me, a big question mark over this, I, I know it's not a big question mark for Chandra, but for me, a big question mark is what is the nature of time reversal symmetry breaking that's occurring uh, on scales of order T star. Um, I would very much like uh, somebody to uh, resolve the questions about uh, whether there really is strong intra-unit cell antiferromagnetism. If there is, that's clearly important. If there isn't, then the uh, uh, subtle evidences of time reversal symmetry breaking are things that uh, one can uh, uh, look at maybe, but not with the highest possible priority. So that's certainly one thing that I would like to see done. I'd like to see much more uh, complete understanding of the physics of the system upon approach to the overdoped side of the phase diagram and exploration of the nature of the superconductor to metal transition that occurs there. That's an interesting quantum phase transition in its own right. And I think that we're starting to have materials that are well controlled over there. So uh, focus of the community on really uh, quantifying the nature of the states that occur over near that phase transition, I think is a very important thing to do. Um, and then continuing to characterize what are the types of order that occur in the pseudo gap phase, I think is proved to be extremely productive. The high field experiments need to continue. I mean, there are a lot of things that are ongoing that are giving uh, very important insight into the properties of these materials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we still have three extra questions. Uh, the first one is by Andre. Andre, please. Uh, Steve, uh, could you could you please comment on the question of the excitations in the nodal versus the antinodal uh, regions? And what I mean by this is, for instance, uh, this is by now maybe a decade ago, a Raman uh, data, which shows that if you look at the velocity of the, let's say, nodal quasi-particles versus the excitations and the antinodes, um, they behave with doping um, as if one energy scale follows T star, the other follows Tc, so one is non-monotonic, the other seems to be increasing as you go closer to half filling. And I was wondering how this fits maybe with the data that you showed of Bernd Keimer uh, or the general ideas that you described in today's talk. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't remember the data very well, so I, I'm not sure I can tell you. Uh, I mean, you know, they're, they're in this pseudo gap regime, there are all sorts of broad features that are identified as this or that. And they may well be right, but most of the features are broad. And it's a little bit of a question of how you analyze the data. Uh, and uh, so since there are so many things going on here, uh, I think one should be careful about making strong statements. That's the only, that's the only comment I have. Well, maybe let me ask the question in a different way. So we're all familiar with the ARPAS data showing this uh, nodal Fermi arcs, right? Where you have more or less pronounced quasi-particles in the nodal region, and then something much more smeared and much less particle weight in the antinodal regions. Um, can one try to associate the pseudo gap as a, a phenomenon that in K-space happens near those antinodal regions, whereas, uh, let's say, coherent scale that you spoke about is something which is more close to the Fermi arcs. Yeah, so people have have proposed that. I, you know, I don't have a strong argument one way or another about that. When one goes deep into the superconducting state, you see coherent quasi-particles in ARPAS over the whole Fermi surface. So in the place where there are super where there are are coherent quasi particles, they they uh, they don't have any arc memory of the arc. They occur over the whole Fermi surface. 
That's the only sharp statement I know. Thanks. Oh, okay, Sam, you can ask the question. Hi, Steve. Um, so a couple of the phase diagrams uh, shown in your talk uh, indicated a tendency, indicated uh, phase separation. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, as a, and, you know, phase separation can, you know, lead on a microscopic level to uh, charge order, as you've described. Um, do you think that there's actually long range phase separation that could be observed in cuprates, but for the, for the long range part of the Coulomb interaction? And could that possibly be that possibly be substantiated in, in film, thin film experiments where you can gate away that uh, long range part. Right. Okay. So first place, the only places where phase separation appeared, as far as I know in my talk, is uh, in phase diagrams of the Hubbard model where there are no long range Coulomb interactions. So as you rightly say, phase separation, I mean, there I there are regions of this phase diagram, especially in the strong coupling limit, where I know for sure that phase separation occurs. Um, but long range Coulomb interactions uh, prevent phase separation. Uh, whether phase- But yeah, does the quote mesoscale uh, uh, idea- No, I, I understood um, what you're asking. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 yeah. off, I'm answering in stages. So, okay. so, um, so there's, uh, you can see here, even on the phase diagram, it's uh, in the sort of intermediate coupling regime, but it's small x, I have phase separation with a question mark. Uh, it was proposed by Vic Emery and me that this was the dominant effect in this region. Uh, I think that's still uh, not completely clear, um, but, um, but at the time, what we did was we documented things uh, along the lines of what you suggested, which is that if you have some method to screen the Coulomb interactions, do you see phase separation? And there were a number of things that, uh, that, that suggested that. For instance, in oxygen doped lanthanum copper oxide, the oxygens phase separated to form uh, so-called staged compounds, but miraculously, the stage four compound was also optimally doped. And we argued that maybe this was being yeah. driven by an electron tendency to phase separation being screened by oxygen. Uh, there is also when you hydrogen doped uh, YBCO, so the hydrogen remains mobile, the system tends to phase separate into antiferromagnetic regions and doped yeah. regions. And we said, look, there are many different um, cases where you screen the interaction, and in all cases you see uh, you see electronic phase separation. We said the only thing that's common to all these cases is the electrons. Uh, now there's a problem with that argument. Uh, this is a, a counter argument that Vic Emery uh, described, which I like. He said, "Scotch and water will get you drunk." and uh, vodka and water will get you drunk. The only thing that's common is water, and therefore we conclude that water will get you drunk. Um, I, I agree that it would be nice to see whether when you screen uh, the Coulomb interactions, whether you get a tendency to phase separation. The problem is that it's hard to screen the Coulomb interactions without affecting other things, and so, either seeing or not seeing phase separation uh, is probably not a definitive proof of an underlying uh, tendency to phase separation. Actually, I just called the, the library to find out about writer groups. You know, are you aware, but the, the particular idea, are you aware if that's been tried, this using using double gating to Not to as far as I know. It? I mean, you know, the ability to make, you know, single bilayer of cuprate superconducting is a very new development. And so certainly that would be an interesting thing to do. Uh, I don't know of anybody that's done it. Wouldn't, but wouldn't, you know, tens of layers still be adequate since, you know, it's really the long range part 
that uh, that's the problem? No. No, the, 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 yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Oh, okay, so Thanks. our last, last question is by Peter. Oh, Peter, please. Okay, uh, hi, Steve. Thanks for the talk. Since, um, since I'm uh, likely last, let me ask a, a leading and philosophical question that maybe has no good answer. So in, uh, in your opinion, how will we know when, uh, when we're done? So what counts as a solution? So, you know, that's, that is a complicated question. It's in some ways a sociological question. Uh, I think these are, so in some sense, we'll never be done. These are the best studied highly correlated electronic system in existence. There are all sorts of really remarkable and interesting phenomena, and they're all worth studying in their own right. And, as, and because the materials are so well characterized, it's the right place to be studying them. And there are more and more things that we want to understand about it. But I guess the essence of my talk is that I actually think the core question has in a sense been studied, been solved. And I'm trying to convince people that that's the case. <laughs> okay, thanks. Oh, okay, if there is no further question, let's thank uh, Stephen, okay. Thanks. That is, thanks everyone for coming to our seminar series. Uh, we, we will continue this series next year, uh, starting from January 20, I guess. We, we still have one more seminar, but not the, uh, this uh, ITC series next week. And if you pay attention, we will have one more announcement, but, but not for ITC, but for the quantum matter, Welcome to join us. And thank you, Professor Steve Kielsen. Thank you very much for the great talk. Bye. Bye, Steve. Thanks for a great talk. Oh, thanks. It's so weird not being able to even see who's there. <laughs>